Greetings, folks. Well, it's time to start delving into the idea of alternating currents. That's what we're about to do. So we're going to start with a DC situation. In a DC circuit, the terminals of your power supply have a fixed voltage associated with them, which means the voltage difference across the terminals is going to be constant. That voltage difference will produce a constant electric field whose direction will go from the high voltage terminal to the low. And that electric field will produce a constant current. So in a DC setting, current, which is the amount of charge that passes by a point per unit time, is very clearly defined. So what's going on in an AC setting? Well, in an AC circuit, and, and I might add this is the symbol that's used for an AC power supply, the terminals of the power supply actually have an alternating voltage across them that varies as a sine function. So there we have it characterized as a sine function. So this constantly changing voltage across the terminals of the power source produce an alternating electric field that motivate charge to move in one direction and then the other direction, and then the one direction, and then the other direction. So if you looked at the voltage across the terminals at one instant, you could find no voltage difference at all. And then in the next instant, you could have a voltage difference across the terminals, which maybe the right side would be positive, and it wouldn't be a very big voltage difference, but it would still be enough to generate an electric field that would motivate charge to flow. And as time would proceed, the voltage difference would get bigger, which would generate a bigger electric field and a larger current. Then the voltage difference would drop down again, producing a smaller current, whereupon we would be back to having no voltage difference across the terminals, and hence no current. Then the polarity would change, so the left-hand side would become the high-voltage side, you wouldn't have a terribly large voltage difference across the terminals, but it would still be there, so it would generate an electric field that was counterclockwise, which would generate a current in the counterclockwise direction. Voltage difference would increase, bigger current. Then the voltage difference would diminish, smaller current. Which would take us back to no voltage difference and no current. Polarity would change one more time and the process would start all over again. The point is, is that the charge carriers don't really go anywhere in the wire. They just jiggle back and forth as the electric field is flip-flopping back and forth at whatever the frequency happens to be of the power supply. And as a side point, if your power supply happened to be your wall socket, the jiggling would happen at 60 cycles per second. Anyway, the real bottom line of this whole thing is, is that the whole idea behind current being the amount of charge that passes by per unit time kind of goes out the window when you're looking at an AC circuit because there isn't really a net amount of charge that passes by per unit time because it's going in this direction as much as it's going in that direction. The net charge passing by per unit time is zero. So how would you deal with the idea of current if you were trying to, to use, for instance, Ohm's law in an AC setting? Turns out the key is wrapped up in the idea of power. So the question that was asked was, how much DC current and voltage would be required to provide the same amount of power as was being provided by the AC source in an AC circuit? Thus came about the idea of the DC equivalent voltage and the DC equivalent current associated with an AC circuit. And these values are called the RMS voltage and the RMS current, and they're defined as 0.707 of the amplitude of whichever the function you happen to be dealing with which probably makes no sense to you at this point, but will shortly. And I might add, I will actually derive this function using a power relationship uh, in class. So trying to get comfortable with a DC equivalent RMS voltage associated with a voltage function that is a sine wave, characterized by a sine wave, we need to look at a sine wave. So here we have the sine wave. Here is the function that defines the voltage. 
Here's the amplitude of the voltage. Here's the frequency that the, that the function is varying at. Here's the argument of the sine wave, time dependent. So what's the function actually graphing for you? Uh, a point on the function is telling you what the voltage difference is across the terminals. So at this point in time, that would be what the voltage difference was across the terminals. Here, the voltage difference across the terminals would be a maximum, and the polarity would be whatever it was. Here, the polarity would be opposite and a maximum. Here, the voltage difference across the terminals would be zero. This is defined as the amplitude, which is the maximum value of the voltage function. Twice the amplitude is called the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Not something we're really going to do much with, but it's something you run into in electronics. And finally, we have the RMS value for the circuit. This is the DC equivalent voltage. This is the amount of voltage a DC source would have to provide to the circuit to provide the same amount of power that this AC source is providing to the circuit. Numerically, it's equal to 0 0.707 of the amplitude. Turns out that RMS values are what AC ammeters and voltmeters read. So when you're told that your wall socket is running at 120 volts, what you're being given is its RMS value. That's the value that your an AC voltmeter would read if you plugged it into the wall socket. What it additionally means is that the maximum voltage across the terminals of your wall socket is not 120 volts. Doing the math, you can see 120 is the RMS value. That equals 0.707 of the maximum. Apparently, the maximum is 169 volts. Actually, it would, if you rounded it up, it would be 170. Most books write it out as 169. Given that you know the frequency at your wall socket is 60 cycles per second, you can plug into the, the sine wave function, multiply 2 pi times 60 to come out with 377, and find that the, the voltage function for your wall socket is 169 sine of 377t. Or, put a little differently, if you ever look at a circuit diagram and you see that there's the symbol for an AC source, and the source has this as its voltage function, you know that basically they're just telling you that they're plugging this thing straight into a wall socket. Anyway, that's the deal with AC circuits and RMS values.